Jeremiah 17, and we will read verses 1 through 11. Thank you, ladies, for the music. Jeremiah 17, verses 1 through 11. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron, with a point of a diamond it is engraved on the tablet of their hearts and on the throne, uh, horns of their thrones, altars rather, sorry. While their children remember their altars and their wooden images, by the green trees on the high hills, O my mountain in the field, I will give you as plunder your wealth, all your treasures, and your high places of sin within all your borders. And you, even yourself, shall let go of your heritage which I gave you, and I will cause you to serve your enemies in the land which you do not know. For you have kindled a fire in my anger which shall burn forever. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land which is not inhabited. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spread out its roots by the river, and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. As the partridge that broods but does not hatch, so is he who gets riches, but not by right. I will leave him in the, in the midst of his days, and at the end he will be a fool. Uh, thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> so first of all, let me say that... Uh, I'm here filling in for Gary Troster, who has been taking care of us for many months. He and his wife had to get to different parts of the country to care for family, as uh, many of you know. Next week, John will be filling in for us, so we look forward to that. So I titled this, Judah's Sin and How Are We Doing? And I'll get into the the reason why I titled it that in a, in a bit. First, I wanted to say that my choice of this message comes from daily or near daily Bible reading. I am reading through the book of Jeremiah right now, and it was this spot that I was at when I was uh, needed to fill the pulpit on this day. So um, I didn't pull it out of a hat. It's not something that I said, oh boy, everybody here needs this. It's uh, where I was at at that time. I was telling Anne, that's why expository preaching is something we look for because you pick a book and you preach through it. And if something there offends me, well, uh, the pastor didn't pick it out. It just happens to be what God has to say to me that week. Secondly, I... Uh, quite often find that things there are directed at uh, no one in particular, but sometimes at myself. Um, what we need to do is let the Word of God do its own work. Um, I try to be honest with myself and find out if I'm disappointing to the Lord in, in how I'm living and serving. And sometimes I find things that are disappointing. They disappoint me. I assume they would disappoint God then, therefore. For example, this passage talks about idols, and now brace yourself. I think I still have idols in my heart. I think I do. And we'll talk about what that means a little bit later. I have a book at home that's, that's titled Illustrations for Pastors and Teachers. So I pulled out an illustration that I liked, and then uh, because it had a date and time, 1982 on ABC Evening News, I, I tried to look up the uh, reference for it. I couldn't find it anywhere. 
And I thought, well, so maybe I won't use ABC Evening News as my uh, point of reference, but I'm still going to use the, the story as an illustration. I just don't, as, as you hear it, I don't want you to think, wow, how morbid that guy is. For whatever reason it was derived, I, st I still think it fits the thinking that we need to address, certainly in a lost world. So I, I started it this way. Imagine this, an unusual work of modern art, a chair affixed to a shotgun. It was said that it was to be viewed by sitting in the chair and looking directly into the gun barrel. This is where it gets more morbid. The gun was loaded and uh, set on a timer to fire at an undetermined moment within the next hundred years. According to this story, the amazing thing is that people would wait in lines to sit and stare into the shell's path. They all knew that the gun could go off at any point and at point black rage, but they were gambling that the final blast wouldn't happen during their minute in the chair. If such a thing were real, would you gamble your life for that minute? Well, I see some head shaking, no, I mean, that wouldn't be wise. Yet many live, uh, many live a life gambling that their sin will go unnoticed or ignored. They leave themselves on the path of God's judgment. Matthew Henry has this to say about this passage in Jeremiah. The sin of sinners is never forgotten till it is forgiven. The sin of sinners is never forgotten till it is forgiven. About Jeremiah, I found out that he was of the priestly line and he was chosen by God to be one of his prophets to a sinful, idol-crazed Judah. They were told that judgment was coming if they did not repent. Chapter 17 is where we begin to read about that. Chapters 18 through 20 are closely linked to this. And I'll explain to you how. In 17, destruction is in view. God tells them through Jeremiah that repentance can be prevented. Go with me just another chapter over to chapter 18 and verses 7 and 8. The instance I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck it up, to pull it down, and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. So this is the word that God speaks to the same people that he's telling that destruction is coming. And he gives that to them in places in 18 through 20. By chapter 21, Jerusalem's doom is sealed which means they want nothing of it. They, they hear the message. They know they can change, but they won't do it. Though this chapter is directed toward Judah, and much of the Old Testament we know is, is uh, history, is prophecy, uh, much has been fulfilled, but yet we can uh, make application of it that fits every age and every culture. I wanted to say, uh, in reference to uh, Jeremiah 18, 7 and 8, can you think of a nation that got exactly that kind of treatment from God? Nineveh. That's correct. Yep. Uh, Jonah didn't want to take that message. He said, I know that if I go and tell them and they repent, you will forgive them. And that's exactly what they did when Jonah finally got turned around and out of the whale's belly and in the right direction. God gives reasons for his coming judgment. We'll look at these a little more closely in a minute, but in verses 1 through 4, it's idolatry. Uh, 
for Judah, it was done with images and practices and even child sacrifice, which they did. Not much unlike our country, I think, in um, what they do regularly through Planned Parenthood. Speaking of idolatry, John Piper says, idolatry starts in the heart. It's cravings, wantings, enjoying and being satisfied by anything that you and I treasure more than God. So it doesn't have to be a, a statue of something that we place up here that we worship. It can be anything that, it could be work, for example. My work could become more of an idol to me than, than the God that I worship. Not that he's my idol, of course, but... Number two, the second reason that he gives for his coming judgment is in verse 5, relying on fleshly arm of strength. And so, much like today, many countries and people trust in the government, they trust in others, or their own efforts more than God, more than asking in prayer, or sometimes prayer is the last resort that people use and then another reason that God gives for their coming judgment is dishonest gain found in verse 11. Neither our wealth or others gone wrongfully will satisfy. Matthew Henry said this, either it will be taken from him or him from it. I remember when Pastor Dancer years ago told about 20 Wall Street people who were interviewed just shortly before the Great Depression and oh everything was great and fine they they were uh, they were all making money and doing well and then came the Great Depression a number of years after that the same uh, either newspaper or magazine went back to interview these 20 men and I think it was like 15 out of the 20 had committed suicide they, they were tied to that wealth. Either it will be taken from him or him from it. In verses 1 through 4, God speaks of the sin of man. I won't be covering every verse in depth, but the, the stylus that was mentioned there in verse 1 was made for writing on hard objects, a metal pen with a diamond tip. I have something like that now. It's a little engraving tool that I can scratch my name onto my tools with. In this case, the heart can become hard to God, to his word, and it can be hardened by sin. The sin in these cases is written down where the blood of atonement should have been. They had the sacrificial system, which they should have been staying with only and keeping with God's word but they were uh, what was really happening is they were still meeting they were still doing the sacrifices though their heart wasn't in it and then they would go out onto their uh, idol locations and worship their idols and to God that was valueless so I want to say that again the sin in these cases is written down where the blood of atonement should have been just turn a few pages over to Jeremiah 31 and verse 33. Jeremiah 31 and verse 33. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And so it is the same for us. We need to make sure we're putting God's word into our hearts. I do a fair amount of quoting of people like Matthew Henry and John Piper and Ironside and others. I, I, it always reminds me of uh, J. Vernon McGee who said he makes a, a milks a lot of cows but he makes his own butter. Um, I try to take those thoughts, give credit where it's due, and then the, the rest I condense into my own understanding. 
Matthew Henry says this, they cannot plead not guilty for their sins are upon record in their own conscience. They are written before God in legible and indelible characters. And that's the indication that we get from their idol worship and their sinfulness that's written down right in here. And God sees it. While they neglected the offerings to God, the offerings of their false gods were still smoking under every green tree. Henry Ironside says, Therefore the Lord's holy eyes see not the blood that was ordained to speak of the sacrifice of his beloved son, but sees the sin of guilty Israel graven on their hearts and upon the horns of their altars. And then he goes on to say this, From Adam onward, one word gives our story. Failure. Man by himself is a failure. Don't worry, I get to some comforting words later. But that's our story, isn't it? We were all lost at one time. And then by his gracious kindness, he sent someone to give us the gospel message. You know, I remember the individual it was in my life and for my father and mother and sister. I think it took me over 30 years to actually realize I needed to write a thank you note to that gentleman for sharing the gospel with me. Now we're talking about judgment, but do you think judgment pleases God? Do you think judgment pleases God? This is what I see some head shaking. No, God does not take pleasure in judgment, but it will come on all unless people turn to him for a salvation. I have just written this and uh, put it right in my notes as quote. You can turn there if you'd like to. Ezekiel 18, 23, which is the verse I should have given you on Wednesday night, Cheryl. I gave her the wrong verse and it one, one was right and the other one was wrong. I was like, what? But it's because I forgot to put the 18 in front of the 23. Ezekiel 18, 23, God says, Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live? And that's what he wants for us. How do we know that? Well, how much did it cost God to send us the, the very means by which we should live? His only son, exactly. Cost him greatly. Cost Jesus greatly. In verse 4, when God's limits are passed, he will send judgment. Let's read that verse again. And you, even yourself, shall let go of your heritage which I gave you, and I will cause you to serve your enemies in the land which you do not know, for you have kindled a fire in my heart, anger which shall burn forever. I would not like to hear those words. There's a reference, it made me think instantly when I read that of a reference in Hebrews, and I had to look it up, but Hebrews 10.31, whoops, Hebrews 10.31 tells us that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This next phrase I use just because I heard it in, on the radio this week. I'll tell you how I heard it. I, I do this to keep my memory fresh so that I look into this. Alistair Begg said, when we lose the passion for evangelism, we have forgotten the grandeur of the gospel. And so I wrote, the grandeur of the gospel should remind us that, but for Jesus' blood, that would be us. That same judgment that fell on Israel and that is pronounced for all who reject God would fall on us if it weren't for that great gospel message that was given to us. Verses 5 and 6 speak of the barren, fruitless man. Let's read those again. Make sure I'm in the right place. There we are. 
For thus says the Lord, Curse is a man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land which is not inhabited. Made me think it must be down near the Dead Sea he was referencing when speaking of this. There is a difference in attitude that is shown between these verses and the next two that we'll look at soon in 7 and 8. Trust in man, ourselves, or government will lead to barrenness. Psalm 20 in verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. Uh, we put the flag at half-mast out here because of <coughs> events <coughs> that have happened over there in Afghanistan this week. There's nothing wrong with having a military that we uh, support and that, that takes care of us, but even in such times as that, our trust still needs to be in the Lord. Um, doesn't mean we don't pray for our military. Doesn't mean we don't pray for our leaders, but the uh, the hand that takes care of us and takes care of us the best is the Lord's hand. If and I, I'm not going to this reference, but in Second Kings chapter six, if you remember the story of Elisha, he's in a certain city and he looks out the window and there's the army of Syria all around where he is. And his servant looks out and is petrified by this and doesn't know what they're going to do. And then Elisha speaks to the Lord and his servant's eyes are opened and he sees that all around this Syrian army stands the army of God, angel host that he has sent. And if you remember that story, God strikes all the army with blindness. Elisha says, here, I'll lead you, take some right into the uh, place where they don't want to be. And everybody's humbled by that, but the, the key point of that is that God's invisible care is what we need to trust in. We need to place our trust there and in His, in His promises. We are living in a troubled world and um, we need to look to God to help us with that. I don't know about you, but when I watch the news, sometimes it makes me angry. And sometimes it makes me worried. Not so much for my own personal safety, but how would I would how would I would provide for Lori? And uh, some of you might think, how would you prepare for provide for family if suddenly the bottom falls out of things? But yet, we need to remind ourselves that we are in God's care. That's where our trust should be. In 7 and 8, we see the blessed man. So we looked at the sin of man, the barren man, and now the blessed man. Let's read those verses again. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river. And he shall not fear heat uh, when heat comes, but its leaf will be green, and it will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will it cease yielding fruit. <clears throat> when both men and women, boys and girls, trust in the Lord, our hope, spirit, and life are like a green tree, fruit-bearing, near water, in good soil. This is a contrast to the two verses we just looked at prior, which was the scraggly bush in a dry, salty place. Um, when, when you read verse 8, what other verse of Scripture does that remind you of? Psalm 1. Psalm 1. Let's turn there to Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3. When I get down close like this, it's because my glasses are, uh, need to be fine-tuned, or I need a larger print. 
Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, in its season whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. <clears throat> There are some patterns for our lives that we can set to be that blessed man or woman, uh, boy or girl. I think of Daniel. When we begin to read in the book of Daniel, that we're told there that Daniel had purposed in his heart there were things he would do and things he would not do. And I think the earlier in life we begin that purposing, the straighter our path is. I have been off path at times. <clears throat> I still have growing to do. Many times I use the mo Word of God more like a snack than a meal. Uh, do I spend enough time reading His Word? I would say I don't. I have begun after dinner to spend a fair amount of time watching television. Um, not that there's anything necessarily wrong with that, but uh, I always think of what Adrian Rogers said. The word for what we entertain ourselves with is called amusement, and that means no thinking. Ah means no, and muse means think. So if we have amusement, we're not thinking. Uh, that wasn't in my notes, that was just for free. <coughs> When Jesus was tempted to turn stones to bread, he responded that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You can find that in Matthew chapter 4. Doesn't mean we don't need food, the body, but what about our spirit? What about our mind? It also needs food, and that is God's word. Now, <clears throat> This is the part of the message that kind of makes me gulp, because, whew, verses 9 and 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. These are strong warnings for us, but God does know the heart. In uh, Psalm 139 and verse 4, I, I looked up that the psalmist wrote that before we speak, he knows it. He knows what we're going to say. I already have a problem with the things I do speak. Um, you know, we get into the New Testament. Jesus said we give an account of every idle word we speak. Yikes. Some of us may think that our heart is good, that we are good people. But in James 2.10, he reminds us that if we break one commandment, we are guilty of all. Break one commandment, guilty of all. I put it down this way. Therefore, if we lie, we are also guilty of murder. That's uh, not good company to be in. But that's, that's how far short of the glory of God we fall. Uh, Paul told us that for all have sh sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The good news is that for those of us who declare that Jesus is Lord by faith, and have made an end of our sins by repentance, there is a change of heart. You remember that hard heart at the beginning that we were looking at? When we know and accept who Jesus is, and we know and admit who we are, then we have a change of heart. Do we still sin as believers? Yeah. I, I do. Now, first of all, that's nothing to be proud of. Second of all, 
Romans 6 says that just because we have the grace of God doesn't mean we should sin more. Uh, you know, if you sin more, you get more grace. I think that's not a, not a good way to think about that. Um, I can't remember the author's name, but I went to uh, Ligonier Ministries for this one, and this is kind of a paraphrase of what he said. But like you placed trust in that pew or chair to hold you up, you transferred your weight from your two legs to that pew or chair. Now, none of us check it before we sit down in it, do we? You know, to make sure it's going to hold you up. It's a matter of faith, sort of, that you sat in that chair. He goes on to say, Our posture of trust, faith, and repentance show that we belong to God through Jesus Christ. Our posture of trust, faith, and and repentance show that we belong to God through Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Verse 11, we'll finish up with this one, seems strange. A lot of the commentaries that I looked at stopped right there at verse 11. As a partridge that broods does not hatch, so is he who gets riches, but not by right. It will leave him in the midst of his days, and at his end, he will be a fool. This shows us the vain attempt to fight against the government of God. Um, the partridge, in one commentary, called it a sand grouse. They were, I had a varying view of interpretations on this. It said they nested on the ground and that sometimes one hen would go to another nest and push eggs with her beak over to her nest so she would be stealing those eggs. In another commentary it said that when another's nest was empty she would sit on those eggs until the mother and father came back and drove her away. Either way, it still results to uh, ill-gotten gain. Uh, this pictures for us one who takes what isn't his, but in the end can enjoy the benefits. <clears throat> Matthew Henry give us, gives us this hope. Those that get grace will be wise in the latter end, will have the comfort of it in death and in eternity. For any here who don't know the Lord as your Savior, today is that day. Place your trust in the finished work of Jesus. God would, by His grace, give it to you. That we know. <clears throat> Some of the key points that I wanted for us to consider is, uh, again, touching on that point, if we're lost, and opposed to God, the time to accept his offer of salvation is now. And uh, salvation is by no other. Peter, in one of his first sermons in Acts, said that there is no other name given among men by, by which he must be saved. Um, yeah, do we get accused of being uh, narrow-minded and exclusive? Yeah, we do. But, but I didn't make it up on my own. And when I look at some of the other comparisons, I think Jesus is head and shoulders above all of that. Secondly, I wanted for us to think that if we have idols, if we trust in something else other than God, or if we give more of our time and attention to it than we do to God, uh, we need to get rid of it and plant ourselves in the soil of God's Word to become like a fruitful tree. Now, I think sometimes this can be an idol. Can it be used for good? Yeah, it can be used for conversation, can be used for... Uh, Bill and I use ours for work, probably others do. I know Rick used to have two cell phones sometimes when he was at Bath Iron Works. In and of itself, nothing wrong with it. How we use it. Same with television. Same with ego. Same with uh, 
Well, it could be any number of things that we could add to that list. And that's where it's not my job to determine what that is. It's my job to determine what it is for me. For you, you determine that yourselves. <clears throat> I was listening to uh, a program that I had never heard this week. I can't even remember the title, but they were interviewing Daryl Strawberry. Who remembers that name? Daryl Strawberry, baseball player. <clears throat> um, I didn't realize that he was actually a Christian fairly early in his career. But one of the things he said was uh, the, the reason why he continued in sin was that he received no discipleship. No one to come alongside him and say, now that you know the Lord, this is how you need to pattern your life. This is how you need to live. And so he had these roller coasters of uh, times when he was given to drugs and women and uh, so on. He was giving his testimony and boy, at this point in his life, his testimony is sound and he's received good discipleship. <clears throat> Just wanted to uh, say that wherever we are in this story, and we know that it fits all of us at some point in time because uh, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But wherever we are in this, uh, examine yourself and find out what decision it is you need to make. And uh, along with feeding ourselves, be good examples to others. Be, a, be disciples. That's what we're called to do. Not just share the gospel message and then leave it, but then disciple them so that they can go on to uh, do likewise. I guess I'm a little early. That's all right. Um, we'll just close in prayer and uh, our closing hymn, and then we'll go out and have some coffee and fellowship. <clears throat> Thank you, Father, for your word and how it shows to us ourselves, warts and all. I thank you that in my life, my fathers, mothers, sisters, many, maybe all of us here, that you have shown yourself and you've revealed yourself. In that case, I pray that we would represent you well in our lives. Take away from my heart any idols that would take attention away from the worship and praise that I should give to your name and to that of your Son and the Spirit. Watch over us as we go on to other things today, Sunday school and uh, this day, that you would take care of us, help us to represent you well. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>